not many people are discussing it at the moment. And then we'll uh, go on to hack a spaceport. Um, so one of the projects that commercial space technologies work on is the development of Spaceport One. Uh, so we'll be discussing cyber security in a real life application and love for all of you to get involved. Um, hoping for this to be kind of semi-structured, but unstructured discussion is fantastic and very much welcomed. Um, so first off, I think it would be best if um, we could kind of go through the panelists. Um, do you know, Ian, if you want to kick off and introduce yourself. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Ian Thornton Trump, uh, otherwise known as Fat Hobbit online, member of the Beer Farmers. Um, I'm broadly familiar with military uh, technology, especially satellites and the role they've played in the current conflict um, and uh, know a little bit about uh, NASA's deep space network. So talk about that. Hey guys, I'm uh, Donan Mal. I'm a uh, security analyst for Quorum Cyber. Um, I'm not like too familiar with uh, cyber security in space, but like I'm familiar with like the concepts in like space itself and NASA as well. So yeah. I'm Joe. Uh, I've uh, spent about 10 years working in cybersecurity, doing different things from incident response and security engineering. And uh, my start in uh, cybersecurity came from uh, learning about privacy to protect uh, myself in terms of personal safety. Hi, my name is uh, Scott Gibson. I'm a, a, a management consultant. I've worked with uh, O2 and Vodafone, and I've also recently helped with uh, Steer Consultancy down in London, looking at a World Bank pitch to try and help satellites into developing in third world countries. So I know nothing about cybersecurity and everything about the people who need it, the, the comms. Fantastic. Um, in terms of, of, of cybersecurity in space, today we'll be discussing both the kind of downstream, which is the, the rockets, the satellites that are generating the data sets, uh, as well as the upstream. And that's the, 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 just the, the raw data and information that you take from these space assets. Um, I don't know if Ian, if you've got some opening comments on that. Sure. So <clears throat> just broadly speaking, militaries in general have been putting stuff up in space since the early days of Sputnik. Um, we're now at a place where we have these very sophisticated data centers in just some of the worst physical conditions you could imagine, ranging from hundreds of degrees centigrade down to almost zero. Uh, the tolerances required on the actual physical things are extraordinary. Um, also, we know that space is a very hostile place, um, and the fact that you can't be heard screaming. Um, but the hostility of the space was um, graphically, I, I remember, uh, graphically displayed when Elon Musk, due to a solar flare, lost about 40 Starlings um, and basically flushed about 150 million, I think it was, down the toilet. <laughs> right there. Um, so. To sort of give you a better sense to the real implications of things like space and space technology from a military perspective is all about looking at things and listening to things. And those platforms, we used to call them keyhole satellites, have now gone beyond the capabilities that you see in the movies in a lot of respects. But I would say the one thing that you have to understand is it's the data that they gather, which is the most important asset. Uh, from the platforms themselves. So I think I've said enough. Why don't we get some... Oh, do we have any other kind of opening comments? Yeah, I think one of the, the other applications is, is also looking at things like GPS because that actually forms one of the most important. So most people came here today by car or even walked here. If you didn't know where you're coming, you'd use GPS and you only have to look at the current situation to just now with... Um, my company's Finnish based, one of them, and the Finns are having a big a lot of problems flying planes in and out of Helsinki just now because there's lots of jamming of GPS going on. So we all know where we get the GPS from, so it actually has a real world effect on us all just now, so I can cover all the comments. So space underpins our kind of day-to-day -day life, whether that's in communications, 
um, even simply logging onto the internet, if that's navigation, GPS, or if it's using Earth observation data through applications like Google Earth or um, maybe even Google Maps. Um, right now, there's a huge growth within the sector in Scotland. And I think it's important that we're discussing this today because um, there's a high likelihood that any one of you in this room might be working within the sector or at least working on space projects in the near term future. And if you're not working on space projects, you might be using data that's derived from space assets, uh, almost undoubtedly. Um, so it's important that you have an understanding of some of the problems that um, may, may come from using these data sets or um, could arise in future. Um, one of the, 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 the reasons for this growth um, within this kind of stock photography showing growth is what's called the new space paradigm. And this is coming from a, an increased risk tolerance, um, driving forward, um, driving forward kind of smaller miniaturized technologies that have an increased risk tolerance. But because of this, uh, cybersecurity and security in general is not really been taken into account. These are small satellites with almost zero redundancy, about the size of a loaf of bread. And this is, this is where a lot of the growth in space is coming from, especially in Scotland. Um, whether that's developing these small satellites or planning to launch these small satellites, um, don't know if you guys have any comments on maybe lean startups and um, cybersecurity. So part of my remit as well is to help companies that are coming in uh, from outside into Scotland and the UK, so internationally. So one of the real sort of uh, measures, doesn't matter if you're looking at satellites, loaves of bread, or bringing in health uh, solutions from abroad, is 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 our we are quite uh, we're quite risk averse and we're quite uh, governance heavy, but that's not a bad thing because even when you look at like the Finnish, who you expect to be quite straight laced, they've got a very lazy fair attitude towards most things security wise, and I think that is a starter for ten. That it doesn't matter where you work, and you know you've got to make sure stuff is buttoned up, even down to things like GDPR, which is the simplest thing. Uh, some people are just putting that as a masthead on their website, and it's not actually lived out inside their company. So I do think there's there's that with with small businesses. Small businesses have a the best small business you can ever go and work for is the two guys that have done their ISO twenty seven thousand and one because they, they they just done it. The worst one is to go and work from is the one who's who's working towards it for the last six years. So you can make your own mind up with that one. That's definitely true. I mean, I've worked on satellite projects in the past where there's there's just, if you knew the codes in order to command the satellites, anybody could come along and, and mess with this. And this is industry-wide. Um, so there's, there's, there's not, I mean, two years ago, I was at a cybersecurity in space event and there's been absolutely no change since then. Um, there's not a, a general acceptance on um, how to manage data from a, in a secure way, and, but more importantly, how to manage your, your space assets in a secure way. Um, and that's yeah, throughout the, the upstream and downstream, and even in the downstream where you've got these huge, huge um, store it but huge asset, huge data assets um and and there's just no security being taken seriously yeah and there's been some really interesting uh, hacks that have been conducted against uh, space platforms kaspersky came out with a report um of the satellites being used as c2 nodes for malware which you know we're piggybacking on the exactly the telemetry data and uh, of the satellites um, you'll remember this very embarrassing moment that happened um, to the Americans. Uh, somebody with uh, Google up, tell me the cost of a global hawk. You just Google that right now, how much one of those is. And then just yell out their price. P 
Bueller. Let's go. Thank you. So a Global Hawk is one of many drones that the United States uses to conduct your surveillance. This is a surveillance only platform. It doesn't, you know, have rockets and bombs and stuff like that. Um, but that Global Hawk was captured by the Iranians in an intelligence operation that managed to compromise its GPS, which was what the public was told. And it was landed as a result of spoofing its GPS. And then it was completely disassembled and torn apart by Chinese people. So this is a great example of the insecurities involved in the satellite system can then play out in various different ways for espionage, because actually one of the most important things to know is what the bad guys, depending on which side you're aligned is, are looking at on the ground. Because if they're looking at something on the ground and you know they're looking at something on the ground, it's time to move quickly. So this whole ecosystem of the drones and the surveillance and um, actual satellite uh, surveillance capabilities is known as geospatial intel. And that is one of the things that's being used and successfully exploited by the Ukrainians. Those Turkish Baikar drones are controlled by a commercial satellite network um, that basically you can buy one and fly it all around yourselves. It's definitely a good point. And there's within the Ukrainian conflict, it's been a very good example of um, different nations taking control of different space assets. And there's been several hacks, both of Russian satellite assets, uh, but also claimed hacks of, of NATO space assets as well, in order to obtain that geospatial information as to what's going on in the ground. And, and that just underlines the uh, importance of and value of that data to, to the, the data users and, and people that need that key information. Um, but what's, what's important about this is these kind of James Bond scenarios uh, with the bad guys kind of crashing things into each other um, are, are now becoming more possible and more likely. Um, it's, it's now kind of possible to uh, obtain the codes in order to uh, do hostile maneuvers of satellites, maybe kind of uh, putting, a man, put, putting an orbital maneuver in so that um, things crash into each other. And it, that might sound apocalyptic, uh, but it's, it's, it, there's a real kind of potential for that to happen. Um, and satellite programs can, can take up to, you know, they can take, they all take around 24 months and that's on the low end. Um, there's a massive effect on revenues if you, you take a satellite asset out. If you don't have a space asset, it's not going to generate data, which is going, not going to generate money. So that's a huge problem. But also the, the cost of putting something in space, um, it costs the same amount for the, the equivalent weight in gold generally. Um, that's the, a good way to, to look at it. Um, and then there's also a thing called Kessler syndrome, which um, could be used by a hostile um, actor in order to make nobody be able to use space. If you crash one thing into, each, into one thing, it could cause a chain reaction which then ruins it for everybody. Um, I don't know if you guys have any kind of inputs on, on hostile space actors or maybe actors that could cause these kind of actions and, and how to, to prevent these kind of problems from a, a high level. Um, so tying this into uh, what we've already discussed as well, uh, when you're looking at communicating with satellites, uh, like to maybe liken that to Wi-Fi. Uh, and if you can hack Wi-Fi, uh, this kind of affects a room. And you know maybe you can use a Pringles can to make a directional antenna and you can get a kilometer range on Wi-Fi, but ultimately it's always gonna be quite limited. Whereas with satellite communication, you can kind of assume that everybody in your hemisphere is probably going to be able to intercept that in some way. And there was an article in The Intercept some years ago uh, showing uh, some 
uh, interception of drone feeds uh, in Israel. Uh, so in that case, it was kind of passive eavesdropping on the feeds between the satellites and the drones. Uh, I think in terms of uh, risks for collisions in space, if you can passively eavesdrop, uh, it might also be possible uh, to actually send commands to, to satellites as well. I think as a kind of high level uh, defense, we need to make sure that the cryptography that's being used to authenticate the communications and encrypt the communications is really sound. Uh, and if you think about how long it took uh, Wi-Fi uh, to come from the kind of dreadful standards that it was at 20 years ago to the kind of uh, pretty reasonable WPA3 standards that we have now, uh, I think uh, this is something that we really should be focusing on. That's, that's a really good point. And, and a lot of the frequencies as well that satellites use are very similar to Wi-Fi, and you can use a, a, a directional kind of Yagi antenna in order to capture the, the, the UHF signals down, and you could command them up with VHF as well. So there's, there, there is definitely a, a, um, a possibility of piggy in the middle attacks where you're just kind of listening in and, and then kind of doing your own thing. Um, do, you, do you have any kind of insight into the, the piggy in the middle attacks? Not, not exactly. Um, but like, like this thought occurred to me, like, um, uh, like space travel becomes more and more dominant, like in, in the future. And like, you try to travel with other planets, like Elon's trying to like travel to Mars at the moment. Um, I think it's like comes apparent, like, and threat actors may turn their attention towards likes of satellites, as we've mentioned, and, you know, use ransomware to like hold these like satellites hostage. So people may not be able to watch TV or be able to communicate properly with them. Um, back to like, command and control. So like it may be the case of like, you know, ransomware will have like a new like kind of like dominance in space with spy actors just again turning their attention towards it. So yeah. Yes, yeah, a very good point about ransomware. And um I mean, it's it's a huge, a huge kind of um aspect to cybersecurity in general. But um being able to capture a, a space asset and then convert that into um a kind of ransom um, and take it hostage effectively is is a real threat too. Um, is there is there any kind of we've 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 had a very brief overview of of the the need for cybersecurity in space. Um, is is there any kind of points that you guys would like to make before we 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 do a dive into the our our kind of case study? I think, yeah, again, it comes back to the, you know, the weakest point. So if you talk about all the, the assets we've had up there for 30 years, which have been mostly military, we mostly assumed that we're all buttoned up and we're as secure as possible. Now, what I think you're saying, I think from that is you've now got uh, sort of commercial partners up there who may not have the same level of security. So just imagine this, uh, uh, just say that loaf of bread satellite is, is cost £2 million, can take out a, what, just pick a figure. What nine hundred million pound satellite system can be taken out? That that's when it starts to get really worried. So, you know, if you, again you look at the, the, the sort of industry, I'm because I mostly do some stuff in health. Even if if you want to put a health device into the market now, you've got to have an ISO around about it. So if you want to do a, a diabetes meter or you want to do something to do, you've got to have an ISO around about it. So every company's got to assume. And that ISO 13845 is normally got a fairly standard sort of cyber security thing that means, means that even at its weakest, everybody's doing the same action. So then it shuts out most of the, 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 the risk. But if what you're saying, and I'm should be sitting out there, by the way, so if what you're saying is you're making me really worried now because what you're saying is somebody can simply bash something smaller into something bigger and I lose Love Island. <laughs> Do it anytime you want. I'll, I'll, I'll jump. I'll jump into that one. Absolutely true. So obviously, you know, uh, NASA is a great example. They have something called the Deep Space Network, which is essentially TCP in space. And what they're doing with that, primarily right now, is taking data from the Mars Observer um, and controlling their little robots on the surface of Mars. Really, really cool. 
they don't want somebody else controlling those robots. And the whole infrastructure that you're dealing with is billions of dollars in intellectual property and investment. So from a threat actor perspective, if I could do something like that and wreck that, it's a massive expense that the that the country has incurred, um, and they're not going to get it back, right? Especially if you start crashing stuff into stuff, right? So, so I think there's this data protection story that now becomes really, really important, and it's along all three of those confidentiality, integrity, and availability triangles that it's really important. It's really expensive. And we have to make sure that it's tamper-proof, right? Um, just on that as well, um, the there's there's huge timelines, particularly on the the military and governmental side of of satellite development. Um, looking at James Webb, for example, you're you're looking at a timeline of about twenty five years for the development of that of that satellite. So you're you're using security architectures that are massively outdated so i i wouldn't trust the 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 kind of the integrity of of that hardware either to be honest the the small stuff a lot of it's just kind of bowling balls in space they haven't got maneuverability so they they just kind of go round and round and round until they degrade but um the older stuff is is potentially an issue i don't know joe if you've got anything in that yeah. Uh, just uh, kind of maybe not totally related, but what, what you kind of made me think of when you're saying that there's uh, this like 20 year old technology up in space. I mean, you know, my iPhone gets an update like once a month. Mm -hmm. So if there is this technology that's up there and maybe security hasn't been considered as well as it could have been 20 years ago. Um, you know, this is something that we should probably change in terms of, of making these satellites updatable uh, and because uh, you know, then we can retroactively patch the security problems that we put in space. It, it, it is possible to kind of upgrade firmware, but it is it is difficult within within space to do that because on a lot of the big space missions, you 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 have these ISO standards, but it means that your your frameworks can be quite rigid and and unresponsive because if you patch your firmware. There's the possibility that you could break everything as well, um, where I mean, if you've got huge geostationary comm satellite, um, taking that out of commission because you've, you've done a, a, a bad patch would be catastrophic. Um, so there's, there's the need for um, kind of very time intensive reviews of the code. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're kind of, you're balancing the risk between uh, making the satellite unusable, which is a disaster, but also potentially leaving some kind of remote exploitation in there where it could actually be used to cause damage in, in the way that we've discussed. Yeah. But there, there, there are different types. I mean, you, you, um, Ian was mentioned about the um, SpaceX and Elon Musk losing loads of Starlink satellites. And with them being much cheaper, um, there's, there's not that same um, need for it. There's there's assets can be expendable in in certain regards, but um, if, unless there's any other kind of points on on the the overview of 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 space and cyber, we can we can jump into our kind of case study. So today we're going to kind of look into hacking a spaceport and um, seeing how we can create as many problems within the operation of a spaceport. Uh, looking at how we can smash um, rockets into the ground, cause explosions, all of that fun stuff. So Spaceport 1 is a suborbital uh, sounding rocket site on North Uist. There's the potential for, for orbital launch in future as well. Um, with suborbital launch, this is where you launch a rocket and it comes back down again. So it might go up to 250, 400 kilometers before landing in the sea. And within that, there's experiments done. Um, the sounding rocket could be guided, so it could um, try to and attempt to go to certain uh, places of interest for researchers or for commercial partners that are looking to 
qualify component software and things like this for future commercial missions. Um, so the, the, the digital architecture of Spaceport One currently looks like this with, with two servers, one with a, an open network, which is connected to the internet and a, a kind of closed network that is not connected to the network, but has uh, some uh, connection to the to the range in order to exchange data on operations. Um, the admin side is connected to the internet, as well as uh, some aspects of, of security and operations. The, the security is within the open network due to the um, the need uh, or the demands of having that infrastructure uh, within a closed network. So there'd be like fiber optics and and uh, kind of secure microwave links that would be required. So it makes it kind of economically infeasible to, to have that on on the, the closed network at this point in time. But in terms of the, the kind of connections that you would have um, from a, a, a social standpoint as well, uh, within a, a launch, um, you'd have a, a mission manager who would give a kind of go or no go. Um, and, and you've got a kind of vast team around them that provides information, uh, coordination with, with local air traffic, uh, management of airspace and sea space to make sure that there are no kind of stragglers and no people that are, are well, where they shouldn't be. Um, if, if they were in that space, it could be a big risk. Um, so there's, there's, there's coordination of that space as well as uh, a whole launch team that ensures the, um, the safe operation of, of the launch. Um, and as well, there's, there's other coordinations between the mission manager and others on, on the engineering side. But this, this whole, uh, team is, is required. For, for safe operation of the site. Now, one thing to mention on this as well is that a lot of the communications here in terms of go, no go are, are done over um, UHF kind of standard business radios. Um, I don't know if we should kind of hand over. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on the system? How would you go about breaking, causing problems to the the users of the site, um, disrupting operations, breaking operations. Does anybody fancy shoot from the hip? Stop. Uh, I would leave it alone between probably uh, September and February. Let the weather take its course, <laughs> possibly. <laughs> yeah, I I I I think it's. Uh, it's it's all it's it's always as uh, penetrable as its weakest link, isn't it? So you've got everything from people. You can look at the Kenora virus come through just now. Uh, lots of people inside uh, critical infrastructure just now are being protected. Uh, you know, it's rife just now. You see in hospitals and everywhere else to try to protect the teams. It would be no different here either as well. Uh, and, and and I think as well is is that is uh, possibly understanding exactly what the what the risk could be to any of the infrastructures and including the, the, the communications as well because you're you're only ever as, as good as your, your your weakest link i think so do you think there's a in terms of social engineering and, and yeah. things like this yeah i mean it's, it's it, well i mean if, if if just say they were putting something up that the chinese didn't want to go up yeah, yeah, you're you're on everything then. You're on uh, all the sort of. I mean, I I've been talking to quite a lot of the the people out here about uh, careers and what they want to do, and every time I ask somebody about you know pick three things: your bank account, your social media presence, or your your or your your health data. Which one do you most want to protect? And everybody says banking. They're all nuts. It's 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 the one you want to protect your health data because if you've had a good dose of a sexually transmitted disease, I, I could be using that to blackmail you. And then I've got you. So it's, 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 <laughs> if somebody wants to do something, they're going to do it. I think somebody laughing in there. So that was the person that actually managed to uh, prove that herpes was worse than losing a thousand pounds. That's the person that has your health data. <laughs> <laughs> 
Sure, I'll go. Um, I mean, obviously getting a hold of a rocket and being able to drop it somewhere would be really cool. I didn't know that Scotland had ballistic missile technology. So you're right up there with the North Koreans, right? Firing stuff into the ocean every time they think Godzilla is coming out. Anyways, um, you, we need to bridge the air gap because that's where the fun stuff is, right? So we either need to recruit somebody or have somebody make a mistake, right? Or get in there with uh, a pony or something like that, right? So that we can try and get access to the range network. That would be the primary one. Because the range network is what it is, it needs intrusion detection systems as part of its security envelope because you can't just say, oh, it's not connected, right? You need to make sure that it's not connected. The only way to do that is to make sure that you've got the necessary sort of like detection set up so that if it now suddenly can route itself to the internet, that's a problem and that needs to show up right away, right? The other thing that you can do, which is gonna be um, difficult, is you've gotta know a little bit about the technology you're using in order to get and piggyback on the telemetry that you're sending Mr. Rocket, right? And, you know, I remember a long time ago when I was growing up, there's these tin tins. And in one of the tin tins, I think it was Explorer on the Moon. That's exactly what a hostile nation state did, which was basically they were able to take, you know, the tin tins rocket and, you know, mess it up in flight. So it's a realistic threat model for sure. Um, I just don't know about in terms of the modern technology of it is that you could um, send fake telemetry data to the operators, right? And steer it towards like Glasgow or something, right? So you're, so they're looking at their screen, the, the old Stuxnet type of attack. They're looking at their screen. Everything's okay. Everything's okay. Meanwhile, all your centrifuges are exploding, right? So it's the same idea here that we could pretend everything is fine while we're, while we're pushing it, you know, towards the southern parts of um, the UK. Yeah, but, but no. You would want to hit Paisley, yeah, you know, because we call that regeneration in Paisley. Um, some one point to make in terms of the the operations of the vehicle. Um, there's what's called a flight termination system, and that's controlled generally with a. A, heart, a radio heartbeat that would just be sent to the um, to the, the the rocket, and if if there isn't that heartbeat detected, it would just blow up. Um, the other the other way it could be done is is if there's any kind of signal on a certain frequency, it would just blow up the rocket. Um, so there's there's two potential things there. Um, if if you want to send it to Glasgow, you probably need to have some kind of um, system that allowed for uh, the flight termination system not to be um, ignited. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Stuxnet example has already been taken, uh, but uh, I think it is still a good example of how an air gap is not necessarily enough to protect your programmable logic controllers and your SCADA systems. And I think that these systems are still really, really difficult to defend in general. Uh, and uh, in those examples where you can send data that looks perfectly legitimate uh, to the engineers behind it, uh, it's very difficult to tell the difference between a hack and an accident. That's a good point. Yeah. Because like, I've seen the, in the second screenshot, there was IoT devices, so like possibly looking for like vulnerable devices that could be like, you know, possibly open to the, the internet or like kind of poor security to them attached, like poor password. Um, uh, health. So, like, trying to have like a go, like, see, like, what kind of the what I, IoT devices are they evolve? Like, um, are there any exploits available to them? Like, just having like a go really from there and just seeing, like, can I be able to get into these IoT devices and connect straight to the rocket? And then from there, you can be able to mess with, like, maybe able to tell the crash on like on reentry or just tell it to blow up. Like, you know, with the history of like space accidents, I mean. People might not know, like, it's like, could be a dumb malicious attack. It could just be like, there could be a fault with the engine or something. So, that's like probably the way, just like IoT devices just be a good way. There is one way to get across that air gap. And I think some researchers at uh, DEF CON about four or five years ago demonstrated using the speaker to pulse information 
from a speaker on the inside of the network to the microphone on a laptop. And there you could have malware. Uh, the only problem with that is that um, you really would have to know physically wrecking the place so you can get that those connections. So if the range is also physically isolated, like in a you know, glass partition, you, you would have difficulties, but it is possible to get across that air gap with technology. I just wondered as well, uh, how often or how quickly we come to the minds of the people doing this, uh, how often they should actually set up a red team to be constantly going at them. I suppose that's what they do that we don't know about. Because if you look at things like uh, the, the British Nuclear Police, which my brother went for, but they decided not to give him a gun, which was a good idea, uh, is that it, they are constantly so... Again, to tell no, no secrets here, but you'll know that they, they, they put things like the SAS up against nuclear st stations and the part of their the, the military pl police is to protect the place, but it's not just about the obvious protection, it's about this, the, the unobvious, about folk, you know, you know yourself, if you want to get in some place, just put a high vis on and a ladder and you can walk in anywhere. I mean, it was, that's constantly in the place. And I don't, I mean, I mean we, although these, this is a really sophisticated environment, sometimes it's the really basic stuff that chips people up. So again, you would, for this, you would be expecting that any air gaps or any physical security would be constantly being tested because and I bet you that's probably the last thing in their minds that somebody might want to get in. First of all, you'd have to get to Euston in the first place. So let's say congratulations to somebody from China or Russia or someone and get into Euston. Probably uh, with the accent up there, you wouldn't notice the difference between a Russian person getting in there or, <laughs> or somebody from local. But I just I just wonder about these things. I just wonder sometimes I think that because it's so sophisticated, we, we forget about the easy stuff, I suppose. That's a good point. Um, I'm wondering if there's anybody in the audience at this point who would like to kind of chime in with the cube. Throw it in. Oh, seems like it's working. Awesome. See, like when you when you mentioned that um, TCP and space thing, uh, that really got me thinking uh, about. To, to kind of contextualize this, um, when we look at malware today, you know, this is a thing that's being sold as a service, uh, and there are botnet operators that have botnets and they sell them uh, to malware authors in order to distribute their malware. So that got me thinking, you know, like what stops anyone from turning a satellite or a bunch of satellites into effectively a space botnet uh, in order to distribute certain types of data? So I'm curious if you had any ideas of how to we would kind of try and protect our satellites satellites against that? It's really going to come down to, to having some sort of integrity checking on the firmware updates, right? So in order, generally, the satellite's going to be con two components, right? A firmware component and then software that's running on microprocessors within that. So a sophisticated actor, you're 100% right, could get in there. To maintain persistence, they'd want to do a firmware update, right? And then they would also want to insert code in order to essentially use it, I would say, probably in a, in a capacity that is not detectable, right? For more for espionage. But there's no reason why, and we saw this with the Russians in the early stages of Ukraine, that they had built a botnet, uh, thousands of, of, of devices out of IoT routers, I believe it was. And they were using it for denial service attacks on the Ukrainian um, internet uh, to assist. So you're 100% right. You could use them as DOS cannons uh, from space, which sounds really cool. Anybody else want to chime in there? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, intrusion detection system and like a space intrusion detection system is probably something uh, that we should consider developing in some way if it doesn't already exist. Um, I think if you were to be using satellites to launch DDoS attacks, you'd see significant differences in the volume of traffic that they're sending. So depending on how they use the botnet, many botnets are not too difficult to actually uh, detect uh, because they're doing uh, very obvious tasks like, like DDoS. Uh, another point to make is that most satellites are running kind of embedded computers and um, normally kind of using uh, an operating system like FreeRTOS that's been 
highly kind of modified for for the the, the hardware that they're running. So that there isn't a kind of um, it would be quite difficult to develop a botnet um, because it would need to be very specialized for each individual piece of hardware. But however, the with constellations, um, that's that could be a, a, a real problem because you've got thousands of identical satellites uh, where that might begin to make more sense. Is there anybody else with the queue? Um, I think one thing that might have been skipped over a little bit was uh, on the next slide uh, with the operators was the uh, UHF communication. So that's an uh, open network. Um, so emergency services are going to use Tetris, which is a closed encryption network. Um, and one of the issues with that at the minute is that it's like got quite a low data transmission and they're trying to move over to the 5G at the minute, which is an open network. But with this, uh, all of those said those no go no go decisions were made over this open network. Um, someone with a with a very strong transmitter near the base site and um, let your imagination go wrong. That's that's actually a really interesting point that you brought up because there was that hack where um, AI machine learning was used to impersonate a CEO that then transferred a whole bunch of money. I think it was it happened to a German executive if I remember correctly. So, yeah, I mean, you could certainly potentially spoof a bunch of um, uh, uh, voice commands um, knowing the system. You could also jam it completely, but eventually they'd find you and give you a good beating, I think. So, um, That was actually used for a proposal for a, a kind of a go, no go dashboard to, to have a kind of some more integrity around the the go no go signal. Um, it's yeah, it's definitely a problem. If you if you have somebody that's good at voices and you have a kind of poor radio connection, um, you could definitely spoof it. And there's there's more sophisticated ways as well. But um, yeah, oh, way up there. Good good to throw in. You'll get it. <laughs> Take off. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, this is continuing on about the UHF one. Um, are these even like are they are they even encrypted at all? Is it generally quite open connections? And if it is open connections, if you're doing some sort of emergency abort, if even without bothering with all the clever things of emulating someone's voice. If you get if if you give an emergency abort command, they're not going to sit there for ages and think, is this is this someone I work with voice? They're going to hear someone shouting that there's an emergency, possibly which could be a situation where there's a risk to life, telling them to abort. And obviously, if you're jamming, there'll be a consistent signal you could track. If someone's just giving a very short abort transmission, actually finding them, they could continue popping about doing that. And if they are emulating people's voices, they could cause havoc for an extended period because they could transmit and move, transmit and move. And tracking them down is going to involve you having to like close off the area and search out for people. And with the range you can transmit at, things like um, I sail and we can have handhelds that can transmit 15 miles things like that, that I can have clips to my waist. Obviously, it's transmitting on a different band, but you can get a handheld device that transmits 15 miles, which you can perfectly legitimately and legally carry. And you could be anywhere in that area. Definitely. I mean, you could purchase a hundred pound radio and, and tune into the frequencies. That's, yeah, very good point. I wonder if maybe we could just put everybody in the one room. So I thought maybe uh, you know, rather than having to get people to talk over radios, put them all in the one room. So yeah, you probably look at all the, you know, what what can you do to bat away all the risks, doing mitigation for these sort of things. But I suppose it goes back to the 
what is it you're launching and why should I be worried about it? I suppose that that's when you start to go up up the risk scale. Uh, done a wee bit of work on the Tetra system and there is there is a new contract out for it because actually the UK government sold it off to a third party country and we'll not talk about that just now. And it's coming back in, I think, to Motorola, I think. And they're putting lots of buses on there to make it a lot faster now and a lot more secure as well. Uh, which is hopefully, but the t- Tetra itself is is one way to, I suppose you would try and mitigate that risk or put everybody in the one room or have a, a password. <laughs> you know, because if, if you went to, uh, so my wife works in a school and if they've got a teacher, if, if she knows there's a, one of the panel come in and they're not happy with the way the te- the, their kid's been taught, it's uh, Mr. Jones is here. When that code goes out over the radio, it means somebody's having a trouble at reception. So there's, there's, I suppose, a, really, a, a, a really basic way of trying to deal with lots of problems. Yeah, and, you know, exploring that kind of threat actor issue, too, you have um, an advantage of locating it in a very isolated spot of Scotland where strangers showing up is going to be the talk of the town. So that can blow your OPSEC pretty quickly. If, you know, <laughs> I am not Russian. Right. That's like, <laughs> okay, sure. But um, I think the other thing that, that is interesting, too, is about the attack where, you know, you broadcast and then you move around, you broadcast, you move around. I, I don't know you and I don't know your background, but that's exactly what you do in the military is you don't stay in one place after you've keyed a message. Otherwise, there's a good chance something could be coming back at you. Mm-hmm. Um, so that kind of tactic and whatnot would be would be quite um, would be quite effective uh, in in that. Um, just to point on the everybody in the room, gen- generally you try and get as many people in the room as possible, but there's there needs to be a lot of coordination with stakeholders as well. Um, so it's physically not possible, uh, particularly kind of on the air traffic control side, um, where those guys are kind of as far as Prestwick, for for you, you need to have them on the radio and. You need to have them kind of physically located. So, so I've got a friend that works there, but I suppose he would love a little sort of uh, job to go to US. Because I, I wonder if you would do that. I wonder if you were going to be flying rockets that often off the place. You might not actually think I'll bring somebody up from there and you drag up. Again, this is where we're going from the ridiculous to the sublime because we're talking about one today talking about putting up satellites the size of loaves and now we could be putting up something that maybe the Chinese or the Russians don't want us to be doing. So I suppose your risk mitigation would go from nothing to everything all the way down. But you are right. If you go to UST and you don't have an extra finger and a squinty eye, you're found out. So you're all right. <laughs> and with your accent, you would, you would just be one of the brothers from across the ocean. <laughs> I think one of the points to add, though, that just uh, came across with, uh, in recent news, like with uh, insider threats, um, Particularly with like you know we've mentioned with spoofing, like it's it's possible like for like so like uh, Chinese or Russian espionage actors to come in and just set up themselves as a real employee, so like that they become in itself uh, themselves themselves as a, an insider threat that will uh, cripple like the likes of what's happening here right now that we're trying to discuss. And um, so it's important to kind of like um, understand like what who like has access to what and understanding like who within like in your organization like who has access to what and like what risks would be um like be brought if like they if they were like i suppose when you're thinking about the russians and the chinese the and again not to that there is enough of a difference between us that would notice somebody coming especially to use they would spot an english person coming to use right well, the, the way this is going to work is that they're just going to have to find out the person who's using the most gas and the electricity and that will be the person they'll go after because by the time you're finished trying to pay for that, you'll be blackmailed. And, and that, that that's how this that, that, that how this has always happened. The, most of the time, these these uh, third parties uh, spend time trying to find the people angle, trying to find out. Again, I go back to what I said, you know, about mental health, sexual health. How can I? What there'll be something about any one of us sitting on this panel that you'll not want to tell outside. And once I find that what happens next. Yeah, I think that's the... 
Yeah, and expanding on that threat landscape, you know, obviously security background checks are going to help out but monitoring financial transactions uh, of employees because in a lot of cases, these people are, do, are, are getting money uh, to do that particular task as the insider threat. And we see the extraordinary efforts that the United States has gone to in countering counter espionage by the every so couple months or whatever, there's a DOJ press release on the next person that they found. And I want to say that part of this whole, like, let's create mayhem is one threat model. The other threat model is stealing the intellectual property of the experiments that are going on there, right? Because as you said, it's very expensive to put stuff up in space. Um, weight equal gold, essentially, is what you said. Um, and so I could imagine I could advance my missile program or my rocket program uh, by not making those expenses, but stealing all your data. And how are you going to steal it? You're going to steal it from a person. You're going to pay them lots of money because there's something happening in their life that, you know, can do it as well. One of the things, I was, again, giving career advice out to people, you know, going through university is if you ever get hired by a software company and they don't do a police check on you, don't work for them. Because it's amazing when I, when I, when I'm doing my sort of governance piece, you know, I talk about, you know, how do you, what do you do when people leave your organization, the security side? What do you do when people join? And if you're not having to fill a bit of paper and says you're quite happy to be security checked out, and in, in the UK it's a fairly common, well well thought out, decent way to just assure. Uh, because if you are, you know, because the company I'm doing some consultancy for just now, they're a health company. You don't want people, you know, who've got some sort of dubious backgrounds involved in being able to take any one of our sort of data there as well. So, yeah, it's get a police check done. In fact, go go with one. <laughs> Just on that, the, the technology that's um, you know, developed through this is controlled through a, an agreement called MTCR, which is the Missile Technology Control Regime. Um, and there's some with COCOM as well, which is kind of agreements around um, intercontinental ballistic missile technology. Um, the, the same kind of stuff for um, if, if you've got like a, a 50 kilometer um, Rocket, there's there's technology within that that could be used for very nefarious purposes. So it's a very kind of good point about controlling controlling your staff, controlling the the data flows internally, and who has access to what. But but it just sounds to be, and I mean, I'm a bit of an outsider. This it just sounds that for for a, an industry that's been on the go for thirty years, and not to have the Billy basic stuff governance. So like, if you imagine, there should be, I think there should be an ISO to cover devices that are going into space as much as other medical devices and then there should be all sorts of governance as you start to go step up the importance from that loaf of bread right up to the thing that could be helping the ukrainians just now because we all know that elon musk has turned over some of his efforts to doing that as well so that that's the bit that and you've done a good job of scaring me today so thanks very much for that i'm gonna go home and hope I, i'm gonna i know how to get home because i've been there before so let's hope i can get somebody else after that Hopefully the GPS will work. Yes. That five minutes, yeah. <laughs> but um, one of the things is that the people driving the industry forward are, are new entrants to, to the sector. Uh, people developing the, the launch vehicles, the satellites that are kind of the drivers of growth at the moment are um, the people at Glasgow University that are developing CubeSats and Edinburgh University. Napier has not got one yet, but hopefully it will soon. Um, but it's it's new entrants that are kind of driving this forward, and that's probably why there's a growing problem as well. I'm just going to go back to that one thing uh, because it is very interesting. There, within the CIA is a department that is, is specifically tasked with non-proliferation, i.e. Uh, nuclear and ballistic missile technology. Um, I'm not going to comment on how well their job is going because, you know, everyone seems to now have a rocket of some sort to, to put something on. Um, but um, this is carefully tracked. This this is not like you don't start a rocket range because Canada had one up in the north uh, in Churchill. Again, very small community. Um, but at the same time, you know, we're taking um, 
really important intellectual property and we're putting it in Kazakhstan to launch it. <laughs> right. So, so, you know, I, I would say that the, the um, work that the CIA does in non-proliferation is the kind of work that doesn't make the headlines, but people tend to have accidents like a lot of Iranian scientists have in the last uh, 15 years or so. That's a good point. And then, um... It's, yeah, it's interesting. There's a lot of Canadians coming to, to Scotland to launch things in future, hopefully. Um, I was wondering if any of you guys had a kind of final last word point. I mean, I'm, I'm highly unqualified to be on this panel, but I've so really enjoyed. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've really enjoyed and, and learned a lot just, just from being, being here today. So yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Oh. Hopefully, too, you don't have too much problem sleeping after that. <laughs>